Hi, welcome to some more accounting with Dr. Rob. Today we're going to talk about asset revaluation. I'm going to go through the steps in asset revaluation and I'm going to do this with a very simple example. So I'm not going to play around with depreciation or anything. I keep it basic. Okay, so let's talk about what we need to do and why, why we're into revaluation. You know generally that assets are carried at carrying amount which consists of the assets basic value, I'll talk about in a, that in a second, um, accumulated depreciation which you should be, feel comfortable with and accumulated impairment. Um, now accumulated impairment only implies for the cost model but we'll come back to that. So those three accounts basically make up the carrying amount of the asset. So potentially an asset is recorded on the balance sheet by three accounts. If you're not comfortable with the concepts of depreciation then you'll need to look for that information elsewhere. Okay, so we know that the basic value of the asset is recorded usually at cost. That's what you should be familiar with by now. But we do have an option of recording it at fair value. So effectively, an entity can choose whether an asset category is going to be recorded using the cost model or the fair valuation or the fair value model, which we'll sometimes call revaluation. And the idea behind the fair, fair value model is actually pretty simple. Um, the idea is this. Yes, cost is reliable, but sometimes it doesn't provide you with relevant information. If I tell you that I've got a building purchased in 1967 for $100,000, that's not telling you a lot about the decisions that I can make in relation to that building this year. So by going to the fair value model, we're providing fair value information. And fair value is sort of like market price, although the concept is a little bit more complicated. Um, another way of saying fair value, fair value is market price if you can see it, but if it's not, if you can't see it, fair value is what you estimate market price would be if you could see it. Anyway, if you want to know how to calculate market value, fair value, have a look at IFRS 13. Okay, so I'm going to work through a bunch of simple examples. And in all of these examples, I'm going to assume that everything else is pretty constant. So leaving aside what's going on with this asset that we're going to talk about, let's assume there's other profits out there and each year those profits are $500,000. Let's also assume that the other comprehensive income, so the other below the line stuff that's happening, is zero. So that we can focus on the differences that the revaluation process leads. Um, and since I'm doing this in Australia, we're going to have financial years that end on the 30th of June. And I'm going to assume that the 1st of July 2001, sorry, the 1st of July 1, year 1, um, to the 30th of June 2 is the first year of operation. So I'm doing that in order that you can see the effects flowing through on retained earnings without having any previous balances there. Okay, so let's move on to the first example. Um, and the asset I'm going to be working with here is land. So I'm trying to avoid complicating this using depreciation, um, complicating this through depreciation. Land, of course, doesn't depreciate. So you bought some land on the 1st of July of year one at a million dollars. And over the next few year ends, you have a bunch of information about what the fair values are. So for the moment, let's just look at one year ahead. And at the end of, uh, at the year end dated 30th of June year two, the fair value is 1.1 million. So if you're using the fair value model, what are you effectively doing? You're effectively committing to keeping the carrying amount up to date in relation to the fair value. So what you're going to have to do with the land at the end of that first year is update its value. Remember, it was originally recorded at 1 million, so you've got to bring it up to 1.1 million. So obviously, you've got to revalue the land up by 100,000, okay? So there we have the land getting debit with 100,000. Now, where's the credit go? The thing about revaluations is they are asymmetric the upward revaluation goes directly to owner's equity to an account called revaluation surplus. It doesn't go through profit. And the reason for that is, I guess, this information is relevant, but we're reluctant to record an information through, any information through profit unless it's a lot more reliable, unless we're a lot more sure. So being conservative accountants, we are a little bit asymmetric in what information we accept into profit. If there's a chance of something negative, we call it an expense or a loss and include it in profit. But for gains and revenues, a chance isn't enough. We need a lot more certainty. So the fair value is still just an estimate. It's not hard, fast, certain information. 
So that's why we're putting it directly to equity, to an account called revaluation surplus. Okay, so if you're comfortable with that, that's the basic rule for upwards revaluation. Let's have a look at the effect. Where has that number flown through? Well, you see, the other stuff is the profit. That just flows through. The revaluation flows through in two places. You see over here on the income statement, the statement of profit or loss and comprehensive income, we've got the revaluation surplus appearing, 100000 Notice that that's not part of profit. That's part of the other comprehensive income section. So it flows through into revaluation surplus, but it doesn't flow through through profit. So over here on the balance sheet, we see the revaluation surplus having a credit balance of 100000 and there's the land down under non-current assets um, at a value of 1.1 million. Okay, so that's a simple upwards revaluation. Well, since we've done the basic upwards rule, let's do the downwards rule. You bought some land at a million, over the next few year ends you have estimates of fair value. At the end of the first year you've got this estimate of 950,000. So, it's clear that we need to reduce the land by 50,000. So here's the credit to land 50,000. The loss on revaluation is treated as an expense. Remember, we're conservative, so we don't have high standards of certainty to record an expense. We don't need to be absolutely sure. There's a chance there's a loss, we record it. So the loss on revaluation goes into our profit calculation. So have a look now at the effect on the financial statements. The loss on revaluation now appears as part of profit. So the other profit was 500,000, we take off the loss on revaluation, leaves us with a profit of 450. And that flows through into retained earnings, and of course the land has reduced by 50,000, it's now 950,000. So what are the basic rules? Just come back for a bit. The basic rule for an upward revaluation is it goes to owner's equity, to an account called revaluation surplus. And that change does not appear in profit. The basic rule for a downward revaluation is it goes to a loss called loss on revaluation, and that is part of profit. So it flows through to retained earnings. Okay, let's come back to the upwards revaluation, and now let's look at what happens another year down the track. If we've revalued an asset upwards, what happens if that revaluation is then reversed? So in this case, at the end of the first year, we've still got that increased value of 1.1 million that we had in example one, but at the end of the second year, 30 of June, to, uh, 30 of June year three, the fair value has now dropped back to 1 million and 50,000. So the journal entry in year two is the same as it was before in example one. The land goes up by 100,000, the revaluation surplus, that owner's equity account takes 100,000. Now look what happens in year two. In year two, we're going to be bringing the land down from 1.1 million to 1.05 million. So there's a downwards revaluation of 50,000. But notice, the land originally started at a million. It went up by 100, and now it's going down by 50. This revaluation in, year, in the second year, in the year into 30th June 2003, um, is a reversal of the revaluation we did in the previous year. So it's got to go to the same place. And that's the basic rule. Where you're reversing a revaluation, the reversal's got to go to the same place. So since the revaluation surplus originally picked up the credit, now that we're picking up the debit, the debit's got to go to the same place as the original credit did. Okay, so that will leave us with 50,000 after we've put that through in revaluation surplus. So let's have a look at the effect on the balance sheet and the income statement, a statement of comprehensive income. What we've got in year one, it's all the same, okay? Um, this is from example one. But look at what happens in the second year. In the second year, when we revalue downwards, there's nothing coming through profit because there's still this balance in revaluation surplus. We can't put anything into profit before we wipe this amount out. Okay, so the revaluation surplus is reduced by the amount of the downward revaluation. So here we've got 50,000 coming in as a minus, hitting other comprehensive income. Okay, and that flows through into the revaluation surplus. Retained earnings doesn't change, it just keeps having these two 500,000s. So they're still there. No effect of the revaluation on retained earnings. So it went up, it increased revaluation surplus. When it went down, it came out of revaluation surplus. So once again, the basic rule. If you're reversing an upward revaluation, because the upward revaluation went to revaluation surplus, the reversal has got to go to the same place. 
Okay, so um, that was a partial reversal. Now let's look at a total reversal. So not only are we going to reverse it, we're going to do a new bit in the other direction. So again, we bought the land at a million. After one year, it was revalued up to 1.1. But after two years, it's got to be revalued down to a fair value of 950. Okay, so what happens in the first year is still the same. This is still example one. No, no change there. Um, oh, I made a mistake here. Let's put a one in there. Okay. Um, because we've got to revalue it now down from 1.1 to 950. So obviously land has to be reduced by 150. Sorry, I missed the one there, I just put it in. So there's 150. And of that 150, 100 is reversing the previous upwards revaluation. So it's got to go, so it's got to, go to the same place. But the remaining 50 is new, right? It, it wipes out the revaluation surplus. And if it's new, it follows the basic rule. So there it goes. So let's have a look at the effect on the income statement and the balance sheet. Um, first year, still the same. Still the same as example one. But second year, well, what have we got? We've got a downward revaluation of 150,000. So the first 100 goes to revaluation surplus to wipe out what's on the balance sheet in owner's equity. And once we've done that, then the new bit follows the basic downwards rule. So that goes to profit as a loss on revaluation. So in this case, 100,000 of the impact is not in profit, it's in other comprehensive income to wipe out the revaluation surplus and only the new bit, the 50, hits profit. Okay, so we're still following the basic rule. A reversal goes to the same place, but a new bit, in other words, something that isn't a reversal, follows the basic rule. Okay, so let's now have a look at reversals of downward revaluations. So remember that in example two, we had land of a million, we revalued it down to 950. Well, now after one, one further year, let's revalue it back up by 30. So the downward revaluation is the same thing we had in example two. Credit land for 50, debit loss on revaluation 50. Pretty straightforward. But what happens in the next year? In the next year, we are reversing part of that revaluation. So once more, we have to put it in the same place. So the land is going up from 950 to 980. So that's a debit to land of 30. That's cool. Um, now, the other side of it, it's a gain, but it's a reversal. It's not going to revaluation surplus. It's got to go to profit. So it's got to be a loss or a gain on revaluation. And since it's a credit, it's a gain on revaluation. So that's where it goes. Just one point that is worth pointing out. The gain on revaluation and loss on revaluation accounts are really the same account. Uh, they just happen to change their name. It happens to change its name depending on its sign. So if it's got a debit balance, you call it loss on revaluation. If it's um, got a credit balance, it's called gain on revaluation. So it is really going to the same place. All right, well, let's have a look now on, uh, at the effect on the balance sheet and the statement of comprehensive income. When we hit it with 50,000 in the first year, there was a loss on revaluation of 50, and so retained earnings took that hit, and of course, the asset was, up, was updated. In the second year, when we reversed that revaluation, since the original revaluation went into profit, the reversal's got to go into profit. So here it is. We're putting the gain on revaluation in here under gain on revaluation in profit. That increases the profit. Notice nothing's going on in revaluation surplus. We're simply reversing an effect that went to profit. And here's land up to date. Okay, so that was a partial reversal of a downward revaluation. Now let's fully reverse it and do a new bit. And I think you can see where this is going. So we bought the land at 1 million. First year we revalued it down to 950 and now we're revaluing it up to 1020. Okay, so the initial downward revaluation, we've seen that before. Example two, debit loss on revaluation, credit land to reduce the land from 1 million to 950. Then in the next year, we're bringing it up by 70. Now remember, we previously took it down by 50. So 50 of this 70 is gonna be a reversal and 20 of this 70 is going to be new. Well, that's what we've got here. We're increasing land by 70, so debit land 70,000. We're reversing the previous loss of 50. So 50 was a loss on revaluation, 50 goes to gain on revaluation. And then the new bit, 20,000, 
that's a fresh new upward revaluation that goes to revaluation surplus. So let's look at the financial statements again. Um, year one, still all the same. Second, first year, all the same. Second year, remember we're revaluing up by 70,000. So where's the 70,000 here? There's 50,000 of it here in gain on revaluation. And that reverses the effect of the loss on revaluation from last year. So retained earnings took a hit last year, but this year we undid the hit. And the remainder of the 70, 20,000, follows the basic rule. 20,000 goes to revaluation surplus. There we are. Okay, now we've talked about revaluation. I mean, admittedly, we've talked about it in a simple situation, so we haven't talked about a depreciating asset, because I wanted to focus on the equity effect, on to what extent is profit affected, to what extent is other comprehensive income affected. Now, I did mention at the outset that we still need to think about impairment for revalued assets. Um, and of course, under IAS 3660, uh, under IAS 36 paragraph 60, we still have to impairment test if there are indication of impairments, impairment any revalued assets. So under paragraph 60 of IAS 36, we're required, if there is an impairment, to treat that impairment as a revaluation loss. So what that basically means is that in calculating our revaluation, we need to take into account what the recoverable amount is. So if I give you some example numbers here, if I give you fair value of 860, 860 and 880 in the three years, I give you fair value less cost to sell, of 50 less, there are 50,000 costs to sell, and I give you a value in use, you can calculate the recoverable amounts. So the recoverable amount is the maximum of these two and the same in the next two years. Now notice, in the first year, fair value is less than recoverable amount. So if we revalue to 860, we're okay. We're not above recoverable, not re above recoverable amount. We're not overstating the asset. So we can revalue to 860. In the second year, same thing. If we revalue to 860, we're not above recoverable amount, so that's okay. But in the third year, if we estimate the fair value as 880, but we calculate recoverable amount and we find it's 830, in that case, the target of our revaluation cannot be 880. We need to revalue it to recoverable amount if recoverable amount is less than the fair value. Now, if you have a little bit of think about this, the only time that recoverable amount can be less than fair value is if the costs to sell are non-zero. See, between each of these numbers, the only difference is the cost to sell, and it's 50 grand. So, because of that 50,000, it is possible for the maximum of fair value less cost to sell and value in use to be smaller than fair value. However, if there were no cost to sell, it would actually be impossible for recoverable amount to be smaller than fair value. So the only time recoverable amount is going to be an issue for revalued assets is if there are significant costs to sell of the asset. Okay, just to clarify, this recording reflects international financial reporting standards and international accounting standards as reflected, I can't spell, um, in Australian standards in August of 2014. This has been Dr. Rob.